Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very first uh, unboxing video of um, the new features in Visual Studio. And this time, it's with the release uh, that we had very recently, which was an update to Visual Studio 2019 uh, called uh, the 16.9 update. And we got a bunch of people here that have been working very hard on all of these features for a long time, and uh, they're very, very excited to show what you can expect to find in Visual Studio 2019 16.9. And um, we have Leslie here as well. Hello, Leslie. Yeah. Hey, Mads. What's up? Oh, not much. I'm just super excited to uh, to finally show what we've been working on for so long. Me too. It's weird not being able to like actually pull the physical entity out of a box, but I am excited to see all the new features for 16.9. We are going to unbox Visual Studio anyway. Yep. It's you know? cool. Yeah, so um, hey everyone, I'm Leslie Richardson, host of Visual Studio Toolbox. And as Maz probably already mentioned, this is a live show where we're gonna see all the latest, greatest features that you should be using in 16.9 Visual Studio. So uh, I think we should get started, but first we should maybe talk about how to even update VS if you already have VS, but maybe you're not sure how to instantly get all these new features if you don't already have them. But uh, yeah, so the first thing you want to do is, is if you don't have Visual Studio, make sure you go to visualstudio.microsoft.com. Uh, it's pretty easy. From there, you can just navigate to the uh, version of VS that you want to use. And then from there, you should have a Visual Studio installer that appears. You might even get a banner when you're using Visual Studio that's telling you, hey, there's a new cool update that you should definitely use. And once you get there, all you need to do is go to the Visual Studio installer. I will share my screen real quick. And locate <laughs> one of your many builds of Visual Studio in my case. But in my case, I actually need to update to 16.9. So I will just go ahead and click update and then it'll walk me through what I need to do. You might have to restart your computer, but after that, it's magic. It just all appears. So if you want to follow along during this stream, feel free to do so. All right, so Mads, I think we should just kick it off. We have a lot of awesome guests today who are really excited to share what they've been working on for 16.9. And we're going to start things off a little bit of uh, Git and GitHub in action, right? That sounds like a really good idea. Sweet. So let's kick it off with uh, Pratik Nanaguda and Taser Gurfal on the Git integrations side of Visual Studio. Welcome. Hey, hey. Welcome. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Mads. Hey. Sweet. So uh, as Leslie mentioned, my name is Pratik. Uh, Tasia and I, we work on the Git tooling in Visual Studio 2019. And in 16.9, the latest release, we've been fine tuning, polishing the edges, and we're actively working on the Git experience in Visual Studio. Um, so once you update to 16.9, you'll get the new Git tooling by default. Um, and so let's go ahead. I want to show you some of the new features that we have. All right. Can't wait. Awesome. So uh, I, I've just updated and launched uh, Visual Studio 2019, update 16.9. Um, you can see that I have uh, the Git changes window open here. I, I don't have any code open in Visual Studio uh, yet, but um, from here I can create a repository, clone a repository, or even access the Git menu um, to get my local existing repositories. So if you're familiar with uh, Team Explorer, in order to connect to a repository to get started with your code, you don't need to um, navigate to the Team Explorer Connect page anymore. You can go straight to the Git menu um, and you'll see your list of local repositories here. So I have one right here, which I'm gonna open up. So that's gonna open um, the, the Git context in Visual Studio for me. Um, and you can see that Git Changes has updated to show me uh, my uh, latest branch um, that I'm on. Um, I was on uh, the bug fix branch earlier. And, uh, and so what I'll do right now is I'll create a new branch. So I want to uh, create a new branch. So I'll go here and I'll click on new branch. And so let me create a new feature branch, but I don't want to base it on bug fix. I want to base it on my main branch. Um, so I'm going to base it on main and go ahead and create that branch. 
So Visual Studio is going to uh, create that branch and get from my repository for me, and I'm on new feature branch right now. Um, so since I've, I've set my context and I know, know what I'm doing, I'm going to jump over to Solution Explorer. And in my repo, um, I have two solutions. So I can see that in Solution Explorer uh, right over here. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, click on Solution 2, because that's the one that I want to open. So Visual Studio is loading, um, loading the solution for me, um, and it'll open up the code. This is if really I have... cool. I like the way that you were able to like so easily create a new branch. Um, mm -hmm. It's cool to see the tooling has come uh, such a long way so quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when I was still the, the Team Explorer, and I didn't even know that was the equivalent to get integration at the time for the longest time. It's like, oh, that's what that window was? Shoot. So just yep. nice to see it streamlined. Mm -hmm. Totally. We've been, we've been working on it, responding to feedback, you know, getting a lot of um, feedback from customers as we've been iterating on it. And so it's still, still a work in progress, but yeah. Um, so uh, I've, I have my program.cs open. It's a simple console app. I'm, I'll make a quick change here. So uh, let's, uh, let's edit this and add uh, some pizza here. All right, um, and so I'm going to save that change. And you can see back down here in the status bar that I now have one change. Um, this is my pending changes. So if I click on this, it navigates me back to get changes where I can see the change that I've made right now. Um, and from right here itself, if I click the plus button, I'll be able to stage uh, these uh, the change that I've made. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stage that right here. And now this is going to appear in my stage changes. And so uh, I'm going to type in a commit message, which I can do from right here. So I'm going to say fixed uh, world uh, to pizza. Uh, and from here, I can also uh, add a work item. So if I just uh, type hash and I, if I have any work items or, or issues, then um, I can link those right here in the commit message. But I'm not going to do that right now. So uh, I'll just do fixed world to pizza and control enter. Um, is a shortcut to commit a message. So now I've uh, made that commit locally. So right. since I made that commit locally, I'm I'm ready I'm ready to push that. But let me just uh, let me just fetch uh, to make sure that there's there's no uh, new incoming commits from uh, any of my other branches. If anyone else has been working on this repo, so I'm going to initiate that fetch. I can see progress down here in the task data center um, and. Uh, and so this branch is looks ready to go, but I'm just going to make sure um, but that it's that it's up to date by going to my remotes right here, and I can see my remote branches. And I'm going to uh, uh, from my main branch, I'm just going to rebase uh, the current branch uh, so that uh, if there's any commits in main, I've got them into into the branch that I'm working on. So I'm going to do that right here. There's a confirmation dialog, and I'm good to go. So the rebase is the rebase is ready. Um, I'm on my new feature branch, and I've gotten a, a success message right here. And I'm I'm ready to I'm ready to push this branch now. So if I go to the push button that's over here, I have the option to push. I can push uh, all tags if I have any tags. If I have multiple remotes, I can also add a remote from here and push to different remotes from here as well. So I'm just going to push normally here, and this is going to go up to my uh, um, up to my remote repository. And this could be GitHub, Azure DevOps, any Git endpoint, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Oops, I think I've gotten a, a small error. And so this gives me errors. So if, there, if I have any errors, it's going to show me errors here. Um, we want to we wanna, uh, remain completely transparent. And so uh, we want to make sure that you know what's going on. And so um, there is all the details of that error up here in, oh, in the output window. That's awesome. Uh, I love that it's a specific error. <laughs> yep, Such a pet yep. peeve when it's just like, you're having problems. Good luck. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yep. We try to be as helpful as possible. So uh, now I'm going to hand it over to to Tasia to show you a few more features. All right. Thanks, Pratik. Thanks, uh, Pratik. That was really cool. Um, so I'm I'm also sharing my screen here. Uh, so I'm starting from where Pratik uh, is uh, stopped. So I I have the Get Changes window open on the side. And we like to call this the on the side experience where you have access to your code, but you still can, you know, manage your day-to-day um, -day Git operations without really, you know, moving away from your code. And Pratik walked us through the, you know, the day-to-day -day flow that um, 
uh, you might want to follow. But then, you know, there are some times where you would like to dive deeper into your repo and better understand what's going on. And so, for example, in this case, uh, I have, you know, two outgoing commits, one outgoing commit or, or one incoming commit, two outgoing commits. And there are some times where I want to investigate those commits uh, before, you know, doing any network operations, for example. And a quick way to do that is just to click on that link. Um, what that would do is actually that would open the full screen uh, get repository window where I, I have access to my uh, local history. I can see outgoing incoming commits here. Um, and I also see all of my branches on the left-hand side. This so, is like my favorite window. I, I love this window. Yeah. Like I'm a visual person, so it's annoying having to go to the GitHub site proper in order to see this stuff usually. So it's cool that it's been integrated in VS like this. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's your source of truth when it comes to your repo. And so it's it's the one place where you can see what's going on, uh, the branch you are on, the branches that others are working on. Uh, you can very quickly with you know a single click preview other branches without switching to them. So it's a very nice, neat place. Um, and so we talked about outgoing and incoming commits. And one thing that users uh, like to do sometimes is to clean up their, uh, their commits. So let me zoom in a bit here to show you how that works. And so I, I, this is the outgoing section. I can select the commit and then use the control button on my keyboard to multi-select commits, right? And then if you right click there, um, let me zoom out a bit. If you right click, you get the option to Squatch. So let me show you how that works. One second. Yeah. So let me zoom in for you. So if I select to squatch, what that is going to uh, allow me to do here is to uh, squash these two commits. I can clean up my commit message and be ready to push. Uh, sometimes, you know, you, you find yourself working for a while, producing a number of commits that maybe it's better to combine together. So this is a great quick way to clean up your uh, local history before pushing it to the remote. Uh, so this is a very uh, cool small feature here. Uh, I also talked about the ability to quickly uh, preview other branches without having to switch to them. So for example, with a single click, I'm looking at master but I'm still on the, the new feature branch. One popular uh, feature also that have been requested is a double click to checkout. Uh, but we have also realized that some users don't like that. Uh, and so this, so today in 16.9, in if you double click on a branch for the first time, let me zoom in here, you'll get this dialog that allows you to customize this experience. And so if you like to be able to double click to check out, you can you know, ch check this box to remember your choice and then select yes. What that would do is in the future, you know, Visual Studio will automatically you know, uh, check out the branch that you double click on. That's um, new, right? Is that a new setting? That's, that's a new in 16.9. Um, it is a way for uh, that, you know, we added to, for users to be able to customize their Git experience and Git behavior. Um, with the new experience. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm just going to say no here. Um, I also want to highlight that if you right click on any other branch, you'll be able to you know, merge, rebase, and rename, delete, and do all of the advanced Git operations there. Um, so Pratik actually did a, a great job walking us through the step-by-step -step process of like uh, pushing your latest commits. But sometimes what happens is actually you are into your code, you are actively working on your new feature, and you forget to maybe you know fetch or pull the latest changes before pushing them. And this is where the, the new experience, the new Git experience shines here. So even if you know you don't really pay attention to the incoming commits and you end up pushing right away we would remind you, right? We will show you this dialogue here that says, we are unable to push because you know you are behind. So, and in that case, we'll give you a number of options to choose from. So pull and push, force push and cancel. Uh, I want to note that force push is, is only available for some repos. Some, some repos don't have uh, that enabled. And I'll show you in a second how to uh, customize you know, the settings of the options you, that you get in this case. 
So for, for this demo, I'm, I'm just going to be pulling and pushing. Uh, and what that will do, it will pull latest uh, changes and try to push my changes. And oops, looks like the you know, Visual Studio detected that there is a merge conflict here. And I can see that in different places. So I can see that in the uh, document I have open. So I, I see this info bar here that says, file contains conflicts, open the merge editor. I also see that in the get changes window. I see that up there, but I also, you know, if you close it, you'll still see that there. Uh, and I get an unmerged changes section uh, in the get changes window, which uh, shows all of the files that have merged conflicts in that case. So you can, you know, click on this button here to open the, the merge editor um, in that case and manually go through the, the conflicts you get, uh, you know, section by section. Uh, we have this uh, button that helps you focus on your conflicts. Uh, so, you know, sometimes there are uh, changes that happens that are not really conflicts. And so you can hide those and focus on your conflicts if you are very confident. Uh, with the changes you are introducing, you can you can also very quickly choose the current uh, checkbox up there, which will uh, automatically you know pick the right hand side uh, in one uh, quick uh, uh, click. And then when you are done, you can accept the merge and commit and push your changes. Um, let me also show you something else. I'm going to exit here. Uh, another quick way to deal with merge conflicts without having to open the merge editor, if you are very confident with your changes, is to actually right-click on the, the file here and choose to keep current or local or take incoming remote. And so this is, this is handy when you know exactly what's happening, what's going on in those scenarios. Um, this, is, this is another uh, area where, you know, the... Um, the uh, interaction is enhanced uh, compared to what we had before. Before we, the the you know the the unmerged the unmerged changes would show in a different window inside of Team Explorer. So today this is a part of the Get Changes window. There is no context context switching in that case. Uh, the that's last that's thing that's I, fantastic. Uh, yeah. uh, that's fantastic, Tasher. Uh, man, this is uh, this this tooling is so far beyond what we uh, what we've seen in the past. So thank you so much, guys, for uh, for showing this. Yeah, Absolutely. and if people want to learn more about those cool tools, where should they go? Their docs and blogs for it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the first thing we would would like to encourage folks to do is to update their Visual Studio to sixteen point nine. That is where they'll be able to see, you know, uh, the latest changes, um, and then they can also go to tools options, and we have uh, links there uh, for them to provide more feedback uh, as well. Um, and we have documentation in place. And so uh, it's pretty easy for folks to get started with the new experience. Great. Well, thanks, y'all. Thank, <coughs> Thank you. Sweet. So Git, really cool. I love Git integration. I find it so useful and helpful. I don't know about you, Mads. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So uh, speaking of other useful things, uh, there is refactorings. Who doesn't like refactorings? Everyone uses those. Those are cool. And then IntelliSense completions, all those cool things. So uh, we're going to bring in Mika and Andrew, who are going to talk about refactoring stuff. And as always, y'all, if you have any questions for the team, we're all ears. So feel free to write in the chat your awesome questions. So welcome, Mika and Andrew. Hi. How's Hi, it going? Good morning. Great. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, so Andrew and I, uh, we both work on Roslyn, which is just another name for the C-sharp and Visual Basic compiler. And Roslyn powers, you know, as Leslie has mentioned, like all the code fixes, refactoring. So those light bulbs and those screwdrivers you see in the margin, those are all powered by Roslyn as well as IntelliSense completion. So we're gonna just demo a few of the latest code fixes, refactorings and IntelliSense features in 16.9. So I'm gonna go ahead and start, I'm gonna share my screen here. And you might notice that I have a bunch of these adornments over here. These are inline parameter and inline type hints. And so these are built into the default tools of Visual Studio. Um, they are off by default though, so you will need to turn them on. So you can turn them on in tools options. I just like to use control Q search and just search for inline hints. We have it both for C Sharp and Visual Basic. And then these are all the different options. So uh, we have 
uh, parameter hints for literals. We have type hints for variables with inferred types, lambda parameter types, implicit object creations. So lots of configuration options here. And if you find them to be, you know, a little bit too distracting to have them on, you can just leave them off and then you can press Alt F1 at any given moment and hold down those keys and it will show the hints for you. Oh, that's awesome. Pretty cool. Yeah. Shoot. <laughs> I've, man, I feel like I've been wanting to see something like that for a while. Like I forget what variables or values I'm using or referring to a lot of the time. Yeah, it's really helpful just to quickly peek and see the different types you're using. So I love this feature. Uh, and what else do we have? We have some uh, IntelliSense completion options. Uh, so we have, uh, we added IntelliSense completion for preprocessor symbols. So here, if I go ahead and use an if directive, and then I bring up the completion list by typing control space, uh, you will now notice, uh, see all these completion options for, um, for you know, symbols that are currently defined in the scope. Oh, so that's, uh, that's a time saver. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <God. laughs> I get those uh, wrong what, all the time too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, me too. I never know what I'm doing. <laughs> Need this. And another uh, new IntelliSense completion feature. Uh, so we have method call completion. So we've been asked, you know, about this for a while. You know, people want to write out a uh, method call or you know an object creation, and so they pretty much just want to have the parentheses added for them and the semicolon. So here, I'll just show you what that looks like. So pretty much what we did was, um, we if you type a semicolon as a commit character, it will go ahead and just add the parentheses and the semicolon at the end for you. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah. I need to learn up on my refactoring tools like this. <laughs> oh, so many lifesavers. I know, and I'll, I'll point you to the docs. It's just ak.ms forward slash uh, refactor code. So you can always check it out there, all the different refactorings that we offer. Uh, and then another feature I just want to uh, showcase is um, from IntelliCode. So you may already be familiar with IntelliCode, which is you know AI-assisted development that uses machine learning to predict uh, different code completions. And recently, IntelliCode added a feature called repeated edits. Uh, where it uses programming by examples to find repeated editing patterns um, to apply those edits for you, which is extremely helpful because, you know, as a developer, you make repetitive changes in your code all the time. And so in 16.9, we added frictionless IntelliCode repeated edits so you can easily apply suggestions in a frictionless way without breaking your editing flow. So let me uh, show you what that looks like because that was a lot, so let's see. So I have a helper function called FTOC. So here, if I want, I could just refactor this a bit to use this. <laughs> and so I have different locations. I can go ahead and use this helper function. And I have another location here. So notice in the completion list, there's now IntelliCode suggestions. You see that purple light bulb. Oh yeah. So if I go ahead and you know press tab, we'll go ahead and just add that for me. Uh, what's really cool too, let me see if I can bring this up one more time, is, let's see, oh. Um, what's really cool too is that it'll also just offer different places where you can apply it, which is pretty, pretty awesome. So it'll just do this in a, I guess, a frictionless way where it will just offer it in the completion list. What a time okay. saver. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can get it. Man, like yes. so many times okay. you're just like correcting a mistake like 20 times. I'm just like, this is just tedious. But what looks like yes. really cool here is that it, it it's not the same thing it refactors to it. It looks at the context. And in here, you put a variable in called F A W E, but that was different in the other ones. And it was able to figure out what variable to put in the method call. Yes. And yeah, which is awesome. And then it also um, gives you another suggestion to apply it. So it says, oh, do you want to go to the next location and do you want to apply this for you? So it's really, really cool. So you can just go ahead and just accept it and it'll, you know, go ahead and update that. So it just updated this for me here. So that's magic. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use that one a lot. 
It's awesome. Yeah. And it's cool that it comes up in the completion list. So that's like the frictionless part, you know, without having to click on the light bulb. So we're testing it out to have it in the IntelliSense list. Sweet. So I think Andrew is now going to show off a bunch of other cool features that we added. Uh, yeah, I have a few more to show off. Uh, and someone called out my guitar collection. I see you. Thank you. I worked hard to get this. <laughs> it is pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, so uh, one of the other features we added in 16.9 was uh, using zone paste. This is off by default, so you'll have to go into the settings to enable it. I already have it enabled. Um, and if I just paste something here that requires task, uh, you can see that system.throwing.task gets added up here. I actually didn't even code this correctly because that should be a double, but you get the idea. Uh, found that I needed that when I was pasting. Automatically adds in for me, makes pasting code a lot easier. Uh, so if you're like me and paste a bunch of code off of uh, websites, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. <laughs> yeah. I've heard um, of them. Uh, if you have not used some of the C Sharp 9 features or in .NET 5 or you know, in whatever you're using, uh, new is a new feature where you don't have to specify the type on the right-hand side if it's already evident on the left-hand side. Uh, so in this case, I have dictionary. I have to say dictionary twice. I even had to wrap this around to showcase this because you know it's pretty long. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a light bulb menu item now to tell you, and it's ID 0090. Uh, and it refactors it to just be new, which is a lot easier for fields and stuff when you have to showcase, uh, like when it's type is evident, I prefer this. Um, so it's nice that the editor is helping me out with that. Um, one other feature, and actually I didn't even write this down, but I've been using it a lot lately. So I'm gonna just go ahead and show it. Uh, if you hit enter inside of a comment, I don't even, I don't know if that was 16 or 69, but I feel like it was 69 and it's awesome. So you should know about it, um, but it keeps the comment for me, uh, I do that all the time and have to recomment my code. Um, it's those little things a lot of times, right? Those little things that, you know, those little paper cuts and uh, now there's one less, thank you. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's one of those small things that like when it happened, I started commenting my code doubly and realized mm -hmm. like, oh wait, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was like a little nice to have. Um, we have some improvements uh, for like removing redundant quality. Obviously this code, for example, uh, is a pretty bad case. Like you, I don't know, the equals equals true is not really needed. Um, so we have removed redundant quality that was added and we'll just clean that up for me um, just to make the code a little nicer. Uh, and I'll go ahead and remove the unnecessary parentheses too. Uh, and the last thing, if you haven't been using, um, why am I, man, I need coffee this morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's statements. Right? <laughs> uh, I know, right? This is early for me. Uh, if you haven't been using if statements, uh, so a lot of times we'll see people add this underscore here, which is a discard in C Sharp. Um, but you don't actually need that. Uh, you can just write it like this. So we added a little bit of a help there to let you know, uh, because features like this are kind of hard when you don't read documentation a lot. So this little bit here, just also remove that for you. Nice little have feature. Um, and then we have a list of community contributions that came in in 16.9. Uh, we're open source on GitHub. So I love, we like to call out all the community members who really help us make Roslyn better and therefore you know make everybody's development experience better. Yeah, That's yeah so you can contribute at uh, githubs.com at Roslyn. And some of these contributors have done, you know, have, 20 PRs in this sprint too. So uh, lots of activity there. Yeah, I love seeing how open this community is. And yeah, shout out uh, to everyone on that <laughs> list. You just got a shout out. So if you're watching this, you're famous now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, a lot of great people here. I love talking to them on GitHub. Um, I occasionally see them on Twitter and stuff like that. Uh, so it's always good to call mm -hmm. them out because they've done some good work for us. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I do have one question from chat, uh, Aaron George asked um, if there were the refactoring suggestions that you were talking about, Mika. So if you mm -hmm. select refactor and it updated five places in the code, will that show up in the console or somewhere where you can verify those updates to make sure all is well? Yeah, so I think if you were to select um, the purple light bulb, the IntelliCode light bulb, it shows 
you can actually see it listed out in a new window of like where the different refactorings you can apply them, the different edits, it'll show you. Cool. Good stuff. Yeah. So um, yeah, thanks Mika and Andrew. I think those Thank are you. just, it's the little things, right? Oh, just yeah. such time savers. I really need to be better about using my refactoring tools because save so much time and frustration definitely yeah well hopefully yeah. we're here to help you find out about yeah. them and mm -hmm. light bulb menu is your friend Don't you should convince that. the yes. debugging team to add hints the, the hints function to yeah. the debugging context too because Ooh. i've been asking for that for a while too that would <laughs> so. be pretty sweet yeah that's First a good advice. Advice. awesome cool all right so thank you y'all and keeping with the net side of things uh there's also the issue of testing what do you you do when you to test your code. So here comes the testing whiz, Kendra Havens, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what's new in the testing realm. So welcome, Kendra. Hello. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk about what we got in. Uh, yeah. Should we hop into my screen share? Mm hmm. Fresh out the oven. Awesome. I only actually am working with one screen, so <laughs> no worries. <laughs> can see it. Excellent. Yeah. New. <laughs> New in the Test Explorer are audio cues. So now when you run a test, uh, you can actually get an audio sound that sounds at the end. So if you're doing other work and waiting for the test run to complete or you got entirely distracted, you now have, you can associate a little ding or um, whatever sound you want actually with the end of a test round. So did, did you hear that? Or yeah, I did hear that. Yes. I heard okay. it. Hey, do you want to reply? Can that be any MP3 that you got on your machine, for instance? It actually can. We actually use .dot um, files. I wasn't able to get the other file formats working, but if you convert it, no. So, oh, Wait. wow. So that was actually a different sound, um, and you can customize these in the Windows Sound dialog. We've also added um, settings in Visual Studio um, in later releases, but for 16.9, use the Windows 10 Sound dialog, um, and we actually have a few other Visual Studio sounds. Leslie, I'm sure you love the breakpoint. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so these two are new, test run failed and test run succeeded. And let's say uh, you want a different failed sound. You can actually, you know, go anywhere on your computer, <laughs> browse that, get your WAV file. And let's see. <laughs> OK, that's so, so great. I was thinking I would use the uh, the Price is Right music when somebody gets the price wrong. It's like, burr, 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 burr. Hey, uh, Kendra, Kendra, is there is there a, can you also associate a sound with like when the test is running? You can do like that Jeopardy waiting music. Um, we don't have that one yet. We'll add it to the backlog. You know, I don't that, know that. If you file a suggestion, <laughs> that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> Let's file it. <laughs> um, yeah. So obviously, we can have a lot of fun with this, and it's really used. It, uh, usable for a lot of people, but it actually started as an accessibility specific uh, uh, feature. So um, developers who were using screen readers were actually having to um, toggle to the output window, listen to the screen reader to figure out if within the output, the test run had completed. So that wasn't super efficient. So um, this is really a part of a bigger accessibility push to make our screen reader for the test explorer a little bit more friendly. Um, but now everyone benefits. Yeah, as is usual with with these right. kinds of improvements. That's so cool. So yeah, everyone is going to have a fun time spamming sounds <laughs> with their tests. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty pumped. So um, another little feature that I want to call out is um, an enterprise. So we in sixteen point five we added fake support for .NET Core. Fakes is an enterprise tool that helps you generate shims and stubs for mocking out your code. It's super helpful, especially with legacy code, um, for you to write tests on it in, and actually have some isolation within your tests without needing to refactor the whole thing. So it kind of helps you create those um, singular like columns of isolation for certain functionality by mocking out the things um, inside each of your tests. So each of your tests are only testing one part. So uh, we added .NET Core support for that. That was really cool. But we didn't have code coverage support. And that is what we've added in 16.9. So uh, if I go ahead and uh, run my code coverage analysis for all tests, uh, and we are, <laughs> we're actually probably going to hear the trombone again because... <laughs> 
Is that the default? Somebody asked. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Um, right. So, you know, just remember these settings if you're going to demo for your boss. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, with fake support now, before fakes tests actually didn't count as towards code coverage. So now you might see um, a bump up in your percentage of covered blocks and a decrease in not covered blocks. And you can actually, with the enterprise code coverage tools, double click and get that code highlighting for what parts of your product code are actually covered by your tests. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. And yep. that's what's new in testing in this release. That's all that's I got. some really good stuff. Uh, I can imagine so many people are just downloading their wave files immediately trying to figure out what they want to <laughs> please, use. Please <laughs> share on Twitter. This is too hilarious <laughs> to keep to yourself. So I, great. <laughs> I can see the TikTok memes coming immediately. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, thank you for sharing all that, Kendra. That's really cool stuff. And is all this available in the docs if people want to go learn more? Yeah, How yeah. Uh, we have our test explorer docs that take you through setting the sound dialogue and uh, what that means. And yeah, we have fakes documentation for getting started with uh, mocking your code. That is so exciting. Yeah. So thanks again, Kendra. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you for uh, thank you for the fakes thing. That's I think that's what makes me most excited. Uh, I have a bunch of code that's old, and I love the fact that I can add kind of very easily. Um, fakes and, and unit tests my old code um, retrospectively. So thank you. Yeah, we have a ton of fakes users. It always, uh, it's, it's always a pretty popular ask to improve it, so. Yep, I believe it. It's great stuff. All right, so also speaking of good stuff, we're gonna pivot a little bit into the world of Xamarin. And so joining us to speak about Xamarin, we got Maddie Hello. here. Hey, Maddie. Hey. Hello, nice to see both of you. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a hot minute. Yeah, I don't know how I'm supposed to follow up sad trombone in Visual Studio. I <laughs> right? text my friend, oh my God, you can set any MP3 file when your tests fail. Yeah, she it's like once you add in horrible. sounds, it's just like, great. I, I mean, here's my demo, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Oh, so well, this is exciting. Thanks for having me on. Um, Xamarin has been getting a lot of a lot of cool stuff in the IDE lately, uh, but Dimitri's right after me. So I feel like I'm kind of like the warm up, you know, like the, yeah. like the opener for him because he's going to show a lot of really cool XAML stuff um, for both Xamarin and Windows developers. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite features that's in Visual Studio 2019 right now and uh, a little bit about Xamarin Forms 5, which shipped recently, which is kind of like the latest version of Xamarin that you get now when you do all your templates in, in 16.9. So I think my screen is shared, so it should pop up. Yeah, sweet, look at this. So I'm all set up. I have my iPhone plugged right mm -hmm. in. There's cable, it works. I've got my Visual Studio right here. Um, and I am using something called Hot Restart, which I realized this backstage. The first time I demoed this, I was with Mads in Las Vegas. Oh, small world. Yeah, good times. <laughs> Yeah, it has come a long way in the past like year and a half. I can't remember how long it's been. It feels like an eternity. Um, but we're in our final release. Um, let me font size this up too. I know this is pretty small. Um, we are in our final preview release of Hot Restart. So in 69, it is in the same place it's been for a little bit. Tools, options, environment, preview features, enable Xamarin Hot Restart. But what it lets you do is debug your app directly onto an iPhone. So I don't have a Mac paired. You would be able to see that this would be great if I had a Mac paired, um, which is kind of the traditional way to develop iOS apps on Windows from Visual Studio 2019. Um, and this is an app I've been building. It's totally, it's totally real. And that's definitely not the same picture every time. Oh, no. Amazing. <laughs> I can see very minute details that only um, botanists would be able to Right, to get, exactly. Get it. And it's definitely <laughs> not a stock photo of an aloe vera. Oh, no, 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 no. It's it's totally, dying. Um, totally legit. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's super exciting because for me, like especially when we pivoted to work from home um, and how restart was really still in preview, like I could get it to work. Um, but now I've actually been able to develop this entire app as complicated and beautiful as it looks without pairing to the Mac at all yet. Um, so my MacBook I use, but it's, it's kind of like, I don't know where it is. It's plugged in somewhere waiting to update to the latest uh, OS release, and I just refuse to open it because it's out of storage space. So I've been able to develop an app that I've used in demos throughout the whole fall and, and now 
like today uh, without having my Mac in the loop for a physical iPhone, which is awesome. Uh, but that is the IDE part of what's amazing with Xamarin. Besides all the XAML goodies, Dimitri will show you, um, such as this on the side here. I'm not going to mention Ooh. it. Cool. Peek. Teaser. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one thing that was super cool about Xamarin Forms 5 is we added a whole bunch of new controls that basically make it easy to make beautiful apps. Um, so this carousel view here, I call this the shopping view. So mm -hmm. when you're on, you know, like lululemon.com and you want to make sure that the leggings from all angles are good, that's a carousel view. Yep. Um, so that's now built in with Xamarin Forms 5. There are uh, swipe views, a whole bunch of other stuff, improvements to Shell, which is kind of our built-in navigation wrapper and layer, which handles all the styling of, I don't know why I'm pointing at my phone, but the, the, the outside of this app and then the tabs, which need to be touched up a little bit because my phone is in dark mode, which we now have support for. So this awesome. page doesn't look like it has anything on it, but in fact it does. It has this one string, it's very complicated. Um, but I can go into this page here and add a background color because I need to now overwrite the default, which on iPhone for the default background color of an app, it's, it's dark, it's black from dark mode. And then I can put my background color on and uh, does my label not have text? I don't know why this didn't show up. Oh, I probably have to give it a text color because I'm in dark mode. Yeah, maybe? No? All right. Well, I don't know why that didn't work, but... You have to see, I did have to overwrite my background color um, mm -hmm. because we had the automatic theming, which is super exciting. Um, and what was the other thing? Oh, my favorite part. So desktop developers, you guys are very lucky, okay? You have one platform that you have to put all your stuff on. Maybe, maybe a couple different types of platforms, like you have to have images and all the different sizes and blah, 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 blah. But you only have to put your fonts in one place. You only have to put your images in one place. And mobile does not have that luxury. You need to make sure that the iPhone has the font and the Android has the font that you want and Windows has the font you want. So typically I would take my font file, my TTF or whatever, and I would stick it into each of these, what we call head projects. So my Android one, my iOS one, and my UWP one. And I would say, okay, that's the font. And then in my shared Xamarin Forms code, I would you know, pull it out from where it needed to be. No longer do I have to do that. And this is a big story coming into .NET MAUI and .NET 6 is, is sharing as much code as possible. I can put my, my fonts now in this shared project, um, which is the Xamarin Forms project. It's where all like the fun, the, the fun in games happens. And I just have some TTFs. They are open source, free license. Mm -hmm. There was a great uh, blog on that in last week's Xamarin Community Standup. Um, and then in my assembly info here, in my app.xaml or wherever, I just give it an alias. And now I can reference it from wherever in my code uh, without having to worry about making sure the file's all over the place. Like I have this referenced um, somewhere in this carousel view. <laughs> Font family should be something. Plant label. Oh yeah, it's in a, it's in a style. So I'm actually accessing it from in my app.xaml. I've got this style and it's got the font family and blah, 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 blah. So everything's all themed out, out of my way, out of my code. So I can't find it when I'm looking for it, but so that it's very neat when I know where things are. Um, that's nice. Yeah, and yeah. that's pretty much what's going on. Uh, Xamarin Forms 5 is out. We have a great blog on it. Um, if you're interested in Hot Restart, go to aka.ms slash Xamarin Hot Restart. Um, it is, like I said, in 16.9, but in 16.10, it's being, uh, it's graduating from preview features to its own little area, which is very exciting. Yeah. So I think hot restart for any feature is always a cool thing to have personally. It's like the amount of time you spend just stopping and starting what you're doing a lot of the time in development is, yeah. it adds up, right? The so it's earliest nice to have that. build. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. The earliest build we did of it was like, it went from like 100 seconds for build and deploy to like 25. And it's like, oh, I'll take yeah. that. And mm -hmm. now I'm like 10. <laughs> Significant so. difference. <laughs> cool. So thanks, Maddie. And thanks for teasing XAML, which Dimitri is going to show us coming up. And yeah, as you mentioned, people should go check out the blogs and the community standups and uh, in order to learn more, right? Yep. Thanks for having me. See y'all soon. All right. See you, Maddie. Thank you. Cool. So yeah, that, next that was very cool. That was very cool. I'm always cool. always think it's such a great demo when you can like connect your iPhone straight to your laptop running Windows and Visual Studio and 
build an app right. and the whole hot reload, hot restart and all this sort of stuff. It just so works. Cool. You Absolutely. don't need to worry about having your other, your, your Mac on standby mm -hmm. or anything like that. That's great. Right. So it's like better for on the go development. Yep. Sweet. So uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about something a little bit similar. Dimitri is going to talk to us about XAML. What's up, Hi. Dimitri? Hey, good to be here. Thanks, folks. Yeah, excited to present right after Maddie. Thank you, Maddie, for, for getting the primer there. Um, I, I'm always happy to talk about XAML tooling. And one of the cool things about XAML tooling is that it applies to all our XAML developers. It's something we really strive for. And we try to make sure WPF, EWP, WinUI, and XAML Forms developers get the best uh, XAML tools and as much cross-pollination of capability as possible. So I'm excited to talk about it. That's awesome. great. All right. Well, we're excited to hear about it. Yeah, awesome. All right, so for folks that don't know me, I'm a PM on the .NET team. Uh, I focus on .NET MAUI, uh, hard reload, and XAML tooling for, for all the things that we're about to talk, uh, talk through today. So let's go to my screen share. I want to point out one thing real quick. We ship a lot of features, and we try to do a really good job at release notes. So if you've not been paying attention to what we've been shipping, uh, these release notes, such as the one I'm displaying right now for 69, will catch you up to everything. You know, I'm not going to cover everything in this session. Uh, so, for example, the MVVM support and the changes only for, for XAML hot reload, all the things I'm about to demo are actually in our release notes. So just be aware that you can always check those out. Awesome. But let's go jump to the demo. So first, I want to talk about uh, XAML hot reload. So XAML hot reload has been around for desktop developers um, since, since the Visual Studio like 2017. You know, it's been, it's been a long time, Dev, Dev 15. Um, and uh, Xamarin developers have really wanted this as well because it makes the building UIs much easier at runtime with real data in those sort of scenarios. So I'm about to show you how that finally works as a GA quality feature for Xamarin developers. So here I have a Xamarin solution open, and this is just the Forms Gallery app. It's available under Xamarin Forms samples. I'll be sure to, to give uh, some links if there's anywhere to post links later on, but it's basically an app that's available to everybody. And I have the app here running uh, in my Android emulator. So I'm using the Android emulator on my Windows machine uh, to, to use this application. So the first thing I want to point out is the application actually has uh, two, oh, Zooming doesn't work with emulator, I forget, uh, it has two different modes. Um, C Sharp pages and XAML pages. So we have to switch over to XAML to do these demos because this is all about XAML hard reload. So how does XAML hard reload work? Uh, so first of all, it's a combination of tools. I'm going to open up something called the Live Visual Tree here. So let's minimize this for a second and zoom in. So Live Visual Tree is, um, let's try it again. So Live Visual Tree is a tool that allows you to see exactly what your runtime app looks like as the composition of the visual elements. And you can expand all of these elements as the app is, is actually running. And clicking on one of these will take you to the source code. So it makes navigating what you see in the app really, really easy. So here, I'm going to go back to my app. I'm going to open it up. And I'm going to go to Label View as just one example. So as I go to the Label View, my Live Visual Tree will update to show um, uh, sorry, yeah, there it goes. So to show the fact that there's a label demo up and running, so I can click on expanding that, and I can actually find the labels that you see here on the screen right here in the Live Visual Tree, which takes me right to the source code file. So that makes it super easy. And this was I not available this. to Xamarin developers. Like Xamarin developers could not do this before, and now you can. And now it's just available out of the box. It's considered GA. There's no more feature flags to turn on, et cetera. So here you go. This feature is, is there for you. Um, this wasn't you there before? This it is, wasn't there this is before. Oh my gosh, what a lifesaver. Yeah. Well, it, it was in preview, right? But it wasn't yeah. there for you as a, as a real feature. And we've actually right. added a lot of clarity in settings. Our customers were pretty confused. We had settings in multiple different places. So now if you go under debug, hot reload, you can see all the settings for everything, including WPF, UWP, Xamarin scenarios. Um, so UWP also includes like WinUI capability. So basically, you have all of this. And changes only is now on by default. So now with changes only on, uh, if you have a Xamarin Forms 5 project or newer, you get this new hot reload, you get this new live visual tree. A ton of work was put in, so we're, we're super excited to, to show that off. Um, one of the other things that we added was this output window. Uh, so in the output window, there's now a new section called Xamarin hot reload. Uh, we're, we're thinking of bringing this feature to all uh, XAML developers eventually, but right now it's just here for Xamarin. So we made the name very, very specific that this is just for Xamarin hot reload scenarios. And this allows you to meet another thing that customers were asking about, which is what happens when something doesn't go right? Sometimes things don't go right. It's a really complicated tech. Um, but sometimes things do go right, and hot reload changes are applied. 
and uh, you know sometimes high reload can't even start for certain reasons. So like if you if you have ambiguity whether this is working or not, this panel will give you this output window will give you a lot more information than it was ever available before, and we'll continue to fix things. So if you're having errors that are actually preventing high reload from working, please let us know by looking in here and posting an AVS Connect feedback with some of the error information you might be seeing in this window. Um, so that's kind of the edges of it, but let's jump into the feature itself. So I'm going to go back to my app, and I'm going to start changing the application. So here's XAML high reload in real time. First of all, I don't think we need font 50. I'm going to go switch this off to be a much smaller font. I'm going to make this font 25, and I'm going to change the text to say, hello, VS unboxing video. I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to just remove this whole label. I don't need this label. I'm going to create a new label. Oops, sorry, my, uh, my keyboard jumped there. So I'm going to create this new label. I'm going to set new text to it. I'm going to say hello and keep it simple. Adding the new label will add it to the running application in real time. So the idea here is that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, shut down your app as you type. Uh, and this is um, actually a real feature. So I broke the syntax. So my app stopped updating. So your syntax can't be broken. We won't allow you to update because that doesn't make sense if it crashed the running application. So I'm going to fix the syntax and like magic, everything starts to work again. Uh, so we're protecting your running app while allowing you to be really crazy with, with the changes you're making. Um, you can like decide to remove a whole section and say, okay, let me start all over again. Then you type it all back in. It all comes back, you know, kind of magically there. If we go to another part of the app, just you know, just to show two examples. So let's go to this images view. I'm going to click on images, and I'm going to open up uh, to, to this uh, different XAML page, right? Because the images live in a different page. The Live Visual Tree allowed me to make that connection of like this new view to this, to this particular element and page. And here I can open it up. And I can say, oh, there's a the Microsoft Campus. Boy, we, we miss Campus. Let's get rid of Campus. I miss it too much. I can't look at it, right? Um, or I, I love Campus so much that I, I want to have Campus many, many times over. Uh, people ask me how how powerful is this feature? Like, uh, are things I'm showing like the edges of it? No, this is just I'm showing actually very little of it. You can you can truly build your app UI as it's running. The only edges that we're going to hit is if you want to change code behind. Today that's not possible. Uh, to change C sharp in a Xamarin app, we're working on it. It's a, it's a feature for the future. But for now, XAML really is open. Changes only really is GA, and we really want you to go use it and let us know if there's any problems. Um, and again, this works for every other XAML app. So your skills in this tooling will transfer to any XAML application you're working on. Wow. That is so exciting. Like I feel like j those two, the live visual tree and the hot reloading, just dramatically improve your workflow, I, I feel, with this. We, we yeah. did something similar like uh, with CSS at some point. And I remember like how hard it was to figure out when the, in this case, XAML is valid and you want to do that update, right? So you have to uh, figure out like what the changes were made and when they're significant enough for you to update. So you don't, you're not too chatty and all that. It must've been really hard to actually get this right. I'm yes. Yes, it, it, it's a pretty massive undertaking of engineers, but uh, people love the feature. It has really high usage and high satisfaction, so we, we feel justified for all of those investments. That's all fantastic. Right, so, yeah. so I've got one last demo here to show you. Again, the only two features new in 16.9, so I'm going to switch over to a demo that I showed previously at .NET Conf. I'm going to hide my emulator here. So this feature um, is all about IntelliSense, so just switching gears for a second. Uh, well, this goes away. Uh, so the IntelliSense in, in Visual Studio, for example, is very comprehensive. Everything you can kind of expect is there. Um, but it's not like every single feature that's in C Sharp. Uh, we're working constantly to, to add more capability. Uh, but the one thing we just added in 16.9 is the support for MVVM. So if your app is targeting MVVM and we can detect the view model, we will give you certain hints that should make your life a little bit better. So let me show you that real quick. The first hint we're going to give you is the fact that you might not have IntelliSense working uh, because you didn't add all the right things to, to the top here. So, uh, and it's a lot to type. So if you do control data on the property, um, we're going to say to you here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit that, hey, um, you, have, you have a binding path. It seems like you're using MVVM behind the scenes, but you haven't set your data context. And if you don't do that, we're not going to be able to give you IntelliSense. And what I mean by IntelliSense is I'm going to go ahead and delete this. Uh, this property, and I'm going to start testing, testing, and I'm not getting anything, right? Like, there's nothing in control dot that's showing up here. So testing might be there. It might not be there. I'm going to hit control dot and say, okay, fine. Give me IntelliSense. It does some magic at the top. And now if I type equals, I get IntelliSense, just like that. 
we fix it for you. This was always possible to do, but you had to know what to type. And you had to know uh, how to type a bunch of stuff over here that, that you know you, you don't necessarily remember. Uh, we've added that with a single click. And once you do it, it's quite powerful. Because now, if I want to create a completely new property that doesn't exist, uh, we can control that, that, in, that into existence with another tool, um, tool tip here with a light bulb. So that works really well. And uh, you get IntelliSense for things that do exist. So it gives you that two-way and data binding experience that uh, will make your life better. And we're going to add more features. This is just the beginning. Awesome. All right, that's it for my demo. That's great. So quick question. Timebender360 asks, does that same thing work in Xamarin Forms? Um, a little bit. We're still working on it. But uh, by 1610, we should have more, more capability there. Basically, every release, there'll be more and more things available. And release notes is the place to go uh, take a look at what we've shipped. So again, I'm not going to be able to cover everything right here. Uh, but if you have any other specific questions, if you're trying something, it's not working. Uh, my There you go. My, my uh, Twitter handle is right there. I love taking questions on Twitter. Please ping me. I will loop in other people from my team who are on Twitter as well. We can answer all of your questions. And you know, if I had unlimited time, I would have shown design time data using decol, and I should, would have shown data binding diagnostic. A lot of really big features were shipped this year. So go check them out. Let me know if you have any questions. That is awesome. And people should definitely go try that out if they like to make XAML projects, because I feel like that can just completely transform the your workflow for the better of those people, all those people. We hope so. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dimitri. Thank you. Sweet. So before we go on to our last but not least uh, final subject, uh, I do want to note that because we're short on time, the Learn TV stream might be coming to a close. So if you still want to find out about what's new in C++ for 16.9, please pivot over to Twitter or YouTube in order to see the rest of this cool stream. So uh, on the topic of C++, uh, first up we have, we're going to be talking about debugging specifically. And we're going to be joined by Moyo and Lisbeth, who are going to share what's new in that space with CMake and everything. Welcome, y'all. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, so hi, everyone. We're from the C++ cross-platform team. And we'll be talking about a really cool new feature in our VS support for CMake. Yes. And in case you're wondering, what is CMake? CMake is a cross-platform and open source tool that is designed mainly for C++ users, and it is used to automate your build, testing, and packaging. And with CMake, you can have a single definition for how to build a project that targets different types of platforms. For example, you can have a project that targets different Windows architectures and Linux, and all you need to maintain is a single build script, which is pretty nice. And with Visual Studio C++ CMake support, which has been fine-tuned over the years, you can easily work with CMake projects. Once you open up a folder that contains your CMake list.txt file, Visual Studio automatically configures your build and IntelliSense settings. And so that way you have access to all the Visual Studio's browsing and, and capability to read your C++ code, like find all references, go to definition, peak definition, just all the good stuff. And this way you can quickly start building, editing, and debugging your code on your Windows machine. Now today, we actually want to talk more about a new experience for remote debugging a single project in a remote Windows machine. Awesome. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah before uh, the current CMake Windows remote debugging support that uh, Moya was talking about, it was very difficult to test and debug your projects in Windows environments that weren't equipped to build and debug locally. So for example, you have a, an environment in which VS wasn't installed or wasn't supported. You had a production machine that it had no development tools. So in all those scenarios, you actually had to manually copy all the files and dependencies to your remote machine and then attach the VS debugger to the running remote process. Uh, so this process was like very tedious, especially if you have like a really, really uh, big project with a lot of dependencies and you don't even know where some of those dependencies are in your machine. So now with this new cool feature, when you press S5 to remote debug a CMake project, so we automatically just kick off a build. We deploy all the necessary uh, project binaries and dependencies to your remote machine. And then we just automatically launch a program on your remote machine and attach the debugger. And Moya is going to show you really quick, a really uh, small example of how to do that. Yes. So I should have my screen shared. Yeah. 
here it is. And so right here I have open a uh, pretty simple CMake project. I am targeting ARM64 right now because an ARM, you don't you can't really run your Visual Studio in ARM64 and that way you have to remote debug. And so this CMake project just has an executable that's linked to two DLLs. And so over here you see I'm in targets view, which is actually a pretty nice view to be in, especially if you're used to the Visual Studio Solution Explorer view. And here you just see like each target you have in your CMake project and you can see the source files and the references. It's just a pretty nice view. And so in order to start remote debugging, you need to set up your remote machine. And all you need to have a remote machine is your remote debugging tools. And I already went ahead and installed it. So when I type remote debugger, I have the remote tools for ARM64 running. This is my ARM64 machine, by the way, if that wasn't clear. And so now I am just going to go ahead and right click the target I want to debug, which is my executable. And I'm going to add a debug configuration. We know because it's ARM64, you obviously want to do a remote debugging. And so we automatically pop up the remote Windows template. So all you need to do is just type in your remote machine name, which I already <laughs> typed before, but I'm going to go ahead and type it again. And so and so once I save this and click on F5, you can see we automatically kick up a build. And because we're targeting ARM64, it's actually doing a local cross compiling. So I'm building in my X64 machine, but actually what's getting built is going to target ARM64, which is pretty nice. Um, and so it hit the breakpoint. So if you look on my remote computer, you can see we have the executable running. And that means we already deployed your executable. We deployed whatever runtime libraries you want. We deployed the DLLs that this executable was also referenced in. And so you can see I have access to my locals. Um, I can step over code. I can pretty much do anything I want to do if I was just locally debugging. And if I hit continue, you see I hit a breakpoint in my DLL. And so everything just works as it should, um, which is pretty nice. And it's just nice that the process is now automated. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end that. And the best part about our remote debugging experience is that we also offer users a lot of flexibility. So if I wanted to deploy to like a different deploy directory that was different from the default, I'll just specify what deploy directory I want. I can also specify if I want some additional files to be deployed by just um, passing in the source path and the target path I want it to be on on the remote machine using this deploy field here. You can also specify if you want or don't want to deploy your debug runtime libraries or your release runtime libraries, or if you want to de deploy both. We allow all that flexibility. And yes, so this is our lovely remote debugging experience for CMake. There's a, uh, there's a comment here that uh, I think is very appropriate. Cool stuff. Wonder how people manage to work without remote debugging until 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was possible to do it, right? It was just a very tedious <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I want to streamline that process. Is it, it seems really <laughs> simple to put together. Just mm -hmm. edit your launch JSON, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. We yeah, we basically take off all the work from you. <laughs> <Or Thanks>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's always the best. It's like, we're taking away work from you. Great. That's less I have to do. <laughs> so, yeah, now, uh, yeah. So, yeah, like uh, just to reiterate this and recap. So, with this new, new experience, so in CMake, you can actually now target developer environments you don't use daily uh, or where Visual Studio is not available. So, like, uh, Moyo was showing like an ARM64 machine where we don't have Visual Studio installed. Uh, you know, any other supported operating system versions. And you can debug on your production machines with no development tools. You only need that remote debugger tools. So yeah, just try it out, everyone, and just let us know how it goes. Yeah, exciting. So there is a question for you here if you want to take it. Yep. So uh, what tech are you using to make this re remote debugging work and there's some like someone was saying well is it web sockets how does it work what is the communication there yeah so we're just leveraging the debugger pipeline actually so in ms build there was already a pipeline that we we're using with the debugger to enable remote debugging and so that's the same thing we're doing so the debugger takes care of everything like the um secure communication that needs to go on on the remote machine excellent Good stuff yep Thank yeah you. Thanks, y'all. Um, that was really cool. And yeah, CMake users should definitely not have too big of an issue, hopefully, with remote debugging at this point now. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. really great. <laughs> yeah. 
So thanks, Moyo and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah thanks for being here. <laughs> thank you. Sweet. So rounding out our unboxing video or what's new in 16.9, we have one more C++ feature that we're going to talk about. Joining us now is Augustin Papa. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Is it Popa? Hi. Hi. Yep. How's it going? Um, doing pretty well. So, cool. so basically, um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about um, some of our latest work to uh, the Microsoft uh, C++ uh, build tools. Um, which we call MSVC. Uh, so if you have used uh, C++ much, you're familiar with the uh, many pitfalls of memory management and how often these lead to security incidents. Um, sometimes those security incidents, if they're prominent enough, they end up in the news and it becomes a big thing. Nobody wants that to happen. That's kind of like the worst case scenario. So how do you actually diagnose and identify these issues um, before they actually end up in, in your uh, production code. Well, one way to do that is to run uh, a runtime uh, analyzer on your code. Um, so there's something called the address sanitizer or ASAN for short. It's a powerful and fast runtime analysis tool. It can identify memory bugs for you to fix. Um, and we have recently done the work to make it available through the MSVC tool set. Um, and we do have a, a blog post actually, um, so if we, switch to my screen, yeah, if you, uh, devblogs.microsoft.com slash CPP blog. This gives you some information on basically how to get started with it. It's now generally available. We just moved it out of experimental as of version 16.9. Um, and this is something worth uh, checking out. Uh, and to actually uh, give you an overview of, uh, of how it works, I'll actually show you a demo of it in action with a real world open source code base, specifically the EA uh, standard, temp the standard template library. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and actually uh, switch to Visual Studio. And what I have here is since I've opened uh, this code base, uh, this is a, currently is an MS build project. Uh, I should mention as well that our work for uh, address sanitizer also works for CMake projects. So you can use it for both MS build and CMake. Um, what I do is what I do here is I have a EASDL test as a startup project. This will run a series of uh, tests on this library um, which comprises that code base and will let me know if, uh, if there's anything uh, going on. But I also have address sanitizer turned on. So what will happen is if address sanitizer catches anything, it will throw an exception and stop uh, on the first thing that it finds. So actually, if you can, um, if you, if we look at the um, console output, we see that there's some stuff that happened here and it looks like address sanitizer, there's a stack use after scope on a memory address. And we see here, there's an exception thrown uh, with that issue. So uh, basically uh, what happened here is, uh, so in C++ objects are destroyed when reaching the end of the containing scope uh, in the opposite order in which they were constructed. And a reference to a variable called buffer one is passed to another variable, int list one. Um, buffer one is defined after int list one, which caused its lifetime to end while int list one still has a reference to it. So the result is a dangling reference and that gets reported by ASAN uh, as a stack use after scope error. So there is a fix for this, which would be to move the definition of list one below buffer one. And I actually do have that already set up. Um, so let me go ahead there. And if I do uh, git merge with uh, the bug fix, let's just go ahead and do that. Okay, and then if we try to run this again, we'll see if we still run into that same uh, issue. So the, the basic workflow here is uh, ASAN will always stop you every time it finds something and then you can go and fix that and then it can go in and, and you can try uh, again and see if you find another thing. Yeah, so and when that tool just, wasn't there, you basically just kind of had to figure it out for yourself where those memory issues were? Yeah, so so there are different ways of of, uh, look, of identifying issues in your code. So there's build errors, of course, those are like the most obvious, oh, I, I need syntax with what I wrote. Uh, and, and then there's static analysis that can run on top of that that also runs at build time. But with C++, uh, there are certain issues that are uh, hidden enough that you really don't uh, find them until you're in runtime. Uh, and ASAN is like another additional layer of protection that you can have, I guess, when you're, when you're testing for these things. You only want to turn it on for your, because it instruments uh, your code in order to, add, to connect to the ASAN runtime. So you, don't, so you don't want to put that in production, but when you're testing your code, you want to link that in and then see uh, if it finds anything. So in this case, um, I think it just, uh, it's running again. Let me just 
pull up the all right so so it's um yeah so it's just running uh, a bunch of tests so, so the first uh, fail that happened was actually in that algorithm test so we can see it got past it which means that issue is now fixed mm -hmm. uh, and yeah it, it's just going ahead and seeing if um, if anything else comes up and it should find another issue shortly um i'll actually just go ahead and describe what i expect will happen while this is uh loading since it's taking a little bit but uh, so there is another bug in a, an algorithm called shell sort, which is causing a random access iterator to be decremented past begin. And depending on which data structure the iterator points to, decrementing it can trigger memory accesses that are only valid when the iterator is within the correct range. And an example of such a data structure is the, the code base's DQ uh, function. So um, if we should see that shortly, and we do have a fix for that as well, uh, for, for that, um, issue that address sanitizer should, uh, should find. Um, but yeah, so it looks like it's it's taking a little bit to run through the test this time. It's a little bit further down, um, but we should soon see another exception pop up and that's just ASAN once again, finding something. And one, one thing I want to want to point out actually in terms of like workflows you can do with ASAN, another thing you can actually do uh, and that's becoming increasingly popular and you're starting to see this being talked about at, at C++ conferences is, um, you can uh, set up a fuzzing pipeline using ASAN. So fuzzing is basically when you run your program with many different inputs in quick succession. Um, so by doing that, and you, if you have ASAN also instrumented on your binary, it, it can essentially find a bunch of different issues all at once and give you a report with like, here's like the 20 things that we found. Um, so this is a way, like if you want to run it at scale on a, in a massive way, hmm. uh, so, so there are different solutions for that. Like the, um, Microsoft just announced something called OneFuzz, which uh, is, a, is a service you can use to, to set up uh, your, your own fuzzing pipeline. Um, and there's, yeah, and, and but a lot of the fuzzing these days is done with ASAN. It's, this is kind of the workflow we're moving towards. So and speaking think, of uh, workflow, is this something you would do like every time, like once a day, or is it before you send a PR, before you commit your code? Like how often do you run this? Um, well, at the end of the day, it's up to you, but uh, the more often you run this when assuming you have changes in your code, the more likely you are to keep up with any any issues that are introduced, right? So the first thing to worry about is if you've never run this on your code base and you have like an older code base that's been around for a while, you should run it and see how many issues are identified. Try to get through the, the list, get them all uh, sorted out, and then um, you could run it as, as, as often as before every uh, commit is made, but ultimately it's up to you. Some, some, some teams may want to do this every couple of months. Some teams may want to do it more often. Uh, if you care a lot about security though, it's probably a good idea to run this frequently. It, it will have a performance hit on the actual like uh, code base and runtime when you run it because it's doing all this extra stuff, all this extra processing behind the scenes. But it's but this is like this is something you do as part of your development workflow, right? So like I, I think it's worth the time to to make sure that you identify issues. So here we have a heap buffer overflow, and yeah, I have uh, another fix for that as well. But I I'll, I think I'll just uh, skip that. Um, right now, just to lack of time. Um, but essentially, I just I would just like do another git merge there. And sorry, I clicked live share, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, so th that's basically how it works. And you, you make you make your code change, you try it again and see how it works. And if you really want to like run, run ASAN with many different uh, inputs on your program at once, you can also do it with fuzzing as well. Mm -hmm. that's something I have in this demo though. That's fantastic. That's a, such a great tool. Yeah, it, yeah, it's very exciting. And again, mm -hmm. please check out devblogs.microsoft.com um, slash CPP blog if you want to learn more about how to get started with this. That is good stuff. Thanks, Augustine. Yeah. Thank you. Sweet. So um, yeah, that was our last uh, topic for the day. But obviously, there's actually a ton more uh, features that we didn't even talk about in this video that are just as cool. So if you want to learn more about the tools that we covered today and the ones that we didn't talk about in 16.9 today, you can always check out the release notes for Visual Studio. We have release notes for every update that we do. And if you are so excited to try out all the cool new things, whether that is hot loading across XAML and Xamarin or all the new testing tools, I'm ready to download all the sound files, uh, <laughs> C++, address sanitizer, debugging, and all the other things that we talked about. Gosh, it's like information overload. Definitely make sure to hit that update button on your VS installer. Don't ignore it. You know you want to try them out. 
So uh, yeah, with that, any other final words, Matt? Yeah, I, I will just say that we also, uh, in addition to the release notes, uh, we do have the Visual Studio blog where we have a bunch of uh, more in-depth uh, detail on a bunch of, of features, not just the announcement of when we release something. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, definitely uh, check that out as well. And um, you know, this is the first time that we're doing these uh, this sort of unboxing, like a new version of Visual Studio is out in 16.9. And um, we would love to hear what you think of this. Do you want this uh, us to yeah. do this again? Let us know in the comments below. And uh, And as always, hit that subscribe button, okay? Uh, we have a bunch of videos here every week. We have more video uh, content on YouTube and elsewhere. So um, yeah, please subscribe. Yep, subscribe, uh, share your feedback. If there's a particular topic that you wanna know more about, uh, definitely let us know. You can tweet us. We're available most of the time. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to any of the guests on the show too. I'm sure they'd be more than help, happy to help you out with whatever feature needs that you have. Yep. And yeah, so until next time, happy coding, y'all. <laughs>